Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues and our cherished members of Ghana Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I trust that all of us are well, and it's, it's our pleasure to come your way once again with another important CPD on the uh, series uh, on our code of ethics. I think that uh, two weeks ago and last week, we considered two key aspects of our code of ethics. And today climaxes it uh, on the upholding our code of ethics, upholding the principle of justice. I would want to once again uh, apologize for the list that uh, we had a bit of uh, te uh, technical hitch and I'm happy to announce that it has been resolved. So for those of us who are online now, I want to welcome all of you and let all of us stay on with us together. We have only three more people to 30. Normally we begin when we are 30. So we'll begin very soon. Um, as you have seen, or you might have seen already on the poster, uh, Dr. Frank Hayford is our speaker for this afternoon. And I will take 
some time to introduce him uh, as soon as we are 30. I think we are almost there. I've seen Dr. Boatin online. Uh, Dr. Boatin, welcome. And our speaker is ready. I see Dr. Hayford. Uh, Dr. Hayford, welcome. And all I see uh, Venice Wallali, uh, Daniel Ansal, BC, Ellie Plin, Kwesi Mujaka, Eric Anku, Evelyn Mensa. Uh, you are all welcome. Uh, Chief Dietitian Rubiata, you are welcome. Patrick Kusi, Patience Ga, Joanna Enusen, Dr. Kwampa, you are welcome. Gladys Ogwe, you are welcome. And there uh, are some galaxies on it that the names are not there. All of us are welcome. Okay, I think we can we can now start. The last person is joining. Uh, we we'll have our thirties very soon. Then we we'll start. All right, it's two twenty, and. We would want I want to introduce uh, the speaker for today's CPD. Um, please, as soon as you join, kindly do your best to mute yourself for us. All right, you are all welcome once again to uh, today, 16th of November, 2022, our uh, last on the series of three on our uh, series, of, a series of three CPDs on our um, code of ethics. And today, Dr. Frank Hayford is with us to take us through upholding the principle of justice as enshrined in our code of ethics. I would want to take time to introduce Dr. Frank Hayford uh, before he speaks. Dr. Frank Hayford, or Dr. Frank Atta Hayford, um, is a lecturer, researcher, and a registered dietitian with the Department of Dietetics, University of Ghana. He is an alumnus of the Center of Excellence for Nutrition of the Northwest University in South Africa, where he obtained a PhD degree in dietetics. He, he has been involved in nutrition and dietetics education since 2007, with a strong interest in clinical, public health nutrition, nutrition in the life cycle, nutrition epide epidemiology, and immunology as well as sports nutrition. He has authored about 16 peer-reviewed full article publications, five published abstracts, and about 20 conference presentations in the above stated areas. He is currently the he is currently the undergraduate program coordinator at the Department of Dietetics, University of Ghana, and an adjunct lecturer in public health nutrition at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, GIMPA. He is a Queen Elizabeth Scholar, West Africa, and a visiting academic researcher at the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine, IDM. University of Cape Town. 
as a lecturer and researcher at the University of Ghana. He has supervised, mentored over 20 undergraduate and postgraduate students, dissertations, theses since 2013. He's a reviewer for many journals, including PLOS 1 and Frontier, and currently being considered as an editorial board member of PLOS 1. He has been part of the organization of local and international conferences, seminars, and workshop, including the African Nutrition Epidemiological Conference, ANEC, and others over the years. He is currently the professional affairs administrator and head of treasury of the African Nutrition Society. He, he is also a member of the International Society for the Study of Lipids and fat, Fatty Acids, ISSFAL, since 2016. African Nutrition Society proposed Task Force on Nutrition and Cancer in Africa, TFNCA, and the National School Based Feeding Program in Africa. He is a proud alumnus of the African Nutrition Leadership Program, ANLP 2015 Group, a former vice president of the Ghana Dietetics Association, and a founding member of Ghana Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. He currently, sorry, he's a proud alumnus of the African Nutrition Leadership Program, ANLP 2015 group, a former vice president of the Ghana Dietetic Association and a founding member of Ghana Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. His current research area of interest focuses on preclinical and clinical trials, specifically on host-directed therapies as alternative and innovative strategies as adjunct treatment of infectious disease like tuberculosis using nutritive agents such as omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. He is a Christian and loves football a hardcore phobia and Chelsea fan. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we can use the emojis to welcome uh, our speaker, Dr. Frank Atta Hayford. Frank, if you can hear me, please, you can share your slide and you take us from here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prince, uh, for the kind introduction. and. Um... Just give me a moment as I share my slides. Um, looking at my internet connectivity where uh, I'm hiding, um, I would kindly ask permission probably at a point in time to, to turn off the video you know, as I do the presentation so that I can um, have a, a smooth uh, presentation. Um, I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. Yes, we can. That's great. Um. Yep. Can you see my screen? No, please. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yeah, so can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. we can. Okay, that's that's wonderful. It, it's so, not starting. It's, it's, it's giving us an indication that the, it has started screen sharing. So maybe a bit of time. Okay. So, um, but what about the others? Uh, I guess probably uh, if your internet is, uh, um, can the others see my shared screen? Yes, we can. I I can see it. And say it okay. So, um, uh, good afternoon, colleagues. 
um, it's always a, a pleasure, you know, to to um, meet, you know, um, you know, and and, and and share, you know, as colleagues. Um, as um, you heard, um, I am yes, a registered yes, dietitian. I, I can see. Yes, I am a registered dietitian, uh, and so throughout the presentation, um, would be hearing me using, you know, phrases like our, you know, uh, we. You know, because whatever uh, I'm going to share um, also applies uh, to me. Um, I would first of all would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank the governing uh, council uh, of Gand um, for the invitation, and, and also uh, specifically the uh, specific profession committee head, uh, 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 um, Bedu, you know, for. Um, inviting me. So uh, this afternoon, as um, he rightly mentioned, um, I would be doing a presentation on the on the third in the series, um, looking at uh, the GAN Code of Ethics. And um, what I'm going to do this afternoon would be to um, sort of, you know, talk briefly. I will try as much as possible to be very brief, and then hopefully the uh, discussion points that you know uh, will generate you know through uh, uh, through my presentation um, would have enough time to uh, discuss you know, and dissect it um, because of course when we talk about um, legal issues we will be looking at upholding the principle of justice and my focus the focus of this presentation would look at our uh, our legal and social responsibility you know as uh, professionals as dietetic and nutrition professionals. Uh, uh, you know, uh, towards local and global nutrition. And why towards local and global nutrition? But this is because um, as professionals, um, and as you, uh, you, you, you may have heard from the introduction, you know, I proudly um, always call myself uh, a member of Gantt, you know, wherever I find myself on any platform. Um, and I'm very sure um, we all do. Um, it is always nice to be associated with, you know, an organization uh, that sort of give you um, a, a legal or authentic authenticity. Uh, but then, um, uh, on the other side, uh, we also have uh, a responsibility, you know, towards uh, making sure that we do not uh, we carry the image um, of this organization that we proudly associate ourselves with, uh, not just locally but also globally. So we, in, in a nutshell, uh, we are ambassadors, you know, wherever we go, you know, as uh, uh, GAND members. So what I'm going to briefly do would, uh, would be to look at uh, some historic overview of the Code of Ethics and Practice. I know the first two presenters, uh, for those of us who have actually been following uh, or participating, have actually given quite a lot of um, um, historic overview of uh, code of, of, of ethics and um, code of ethics and practice, but then what I would do is that um, I would also give a, a brief um, overview, you know, uh, just as a way of um, 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 a revision or to remind us. And for those um, who probably might have missed one or both uh, the previous presentation, and then I will look at the basis for legal and social responsibility from the health professional's perspective, what are the basis um, uh, of uh, legal and social responsibility? And then um, I would move on straight to look at what Gantt's legal res uh, uh, responsibilities and social responsibilities are, you know, um, as outlined or as stated in our uh, current adopted code of adopted code of ethics, and um, I would want you to take note of it. I mean, this is a code of ethics that we have already adopted. Um, uh, uh, what we have been doing for the past three weeks is actually to look at it and and also discuss it. You know, so um, it's it's been adopted. It is not something that um, we are now going to discuss it. So, by way of introduction. Um, at the dawn of medical practice, um, health practitioners have um, had standards of practice uh, centered mostly um, around their relationships with each other. So um, when medical practice started, um, yes, there was some form of uh, standards of practice. And um, at the dawn of medical practice, uh, usually the focus was on the physician. So you realize that these standards 
um, were centered between the relationship between the physicians and, and, and other supporting uh, uh, health practitioners. And of course, between uh, the physicians themselves. But then with time, the, these standards of uh, care actually uh, began to include conduct around patients, right? And then the practitioner's relationship with patients. So um, with time, it became necessary that uh, this conduct and code of ethics, uh, uh, um, it became necessary that um, it's also extended to include you know, the patient um, that um, these health workers are actually taking care of. Because at the end of the day, um, they you know, uh, were the center of attraction. Again, with decades of research and advancements, especially in the area of medical sciences, you know, um, it's led to greater awareness of the need to hold health professionals uh, responsible for the, their actions or uh, inactions. And of course, um, this, you know, with years of research and advancement and with the uh, increase of medical legal issues, you know, it really uh, became, um, I mean, patients, became more aware um, of, of the need to, to, to hold uh, health professionals you know, responsible for uh, uh, their actions and inactions. And of course, as a result of, of this, um, we started having a government, uh, we started having professional bodies and institutions you know, um, coming up with uh, certain codes okay, uh, to govern um, you know, the relationship, especially when it's it comes to uh, healthcare uh, delivery. And of course, that also uh, led to our organization, GAND, also what, uh, coming up uh, with its own uh, code of ethics. And, and as we have already mentioned, over the past three weeks, we have actually been looking at um, uh, the code of ethics. And um, to summarize what we have actually looked at in the, in the past three weeks, um, I uh, wouldn't want to sort of go back and then uh, 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 mention exactly what we did, but in summary, what we have looked at so far is that when providing services, the nutrition and the dietetic pr practitioner should adhere and focus on core customer care values, right? As his or uh, her underpinning uh, ethical conduct and practice. So, um, in, 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 in whatever we do as health professionals, whether being a nutritionist or being a dietitian, um, our focus should always uh, be on core customer care values. Okay? And that should be what really drives us in terms of you know, our ethical conduct and practice. Uh, by that, what do I mean by that? By that, I said, as we, 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 we do whatever we are doing, um, we should be guided uh, uh, by integrity, you know, innovation, okay, with respect, fairness, and diversity in mind. These are some of the core values that should um, underpin our ethical uh, conduct and practice. Um, not only that, in our practice, um, our decisions should be based on science, okay, derived from the best available research and evidence. So this is where um, I remember, I think somewhere last for the very first presentation it came out clearly that whatever decisions we arrive at or whatever decisions we make um, uh, based on our ethical conduct and practice, um, it should be based on, on science. And these are the principles that actually under, underlines or undergirds the principles of non-maleficent, uh, non-maleficence, uh, principles of benef uh, beneficence, uh, the principles of autonomy, and of course the principle of justice that we would be um, looking um, uh, at um, uh, today. Okay. So when we talk about legal and social responsibilities in the context of ethical conduct and practice, um, there are two key concepts that are actually linked to this legal and social responsibility. And these concepts are the morality of duty and the morality of um, aspiration. And when we talk about the morality of duty, um, it simply describes 
well-defined requirements a health professional must meet and then the rules to be followed. And of course, when we talk about the health requirements, um, um, our governing uh, council, the Allied Health Professional Council, you know, have clearly, when you look at their code of, uh, I mean, their, um, uh, uh, their rules or their guidelines, it clearly uh, stipulates um, the requirements, you know, uh, for every level uh, when it comes to a nutritionist or a dietitian, you know, the requirements that um, uh, uh, qualifies you, you know, to be, to be registered as a, a, a nutritionist or a dietitian. And of course, um, they also have their rules um, that uh, we are supposed to follow. And that uh, uh, underlines or that explains what the morality of duty is. And then the second aspect, um, the morality of aspiration, it embodies ideals and principles that the practitioner must strive to agree with or to follow, or, in, uh, or simply uh, the practitioner must you know, strive to live by. Okay? And this uh, morality of aspiration is usually explained from the, our responsibilities as, uh, as nutritionists or dietitians uh, from the social point of view. And hopefully as we go through the uh, presentation, it will become much more clear. So what are the basis for uh, 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 social and legal responsibilities, if, if one may ask? Right. And when we talk about the, the basis for our legal and social responsibility, uh, when it comes to the, uh, our legal, what our legal responsibilities are, enacting laws have become part of our healthcare system in recent years, right? And of course, uh, the medical nutrition, uh, in terms of when it comes to medical nutrition therapy, uh, is, is not an exception. And of course, I did mention that uh, this is also partly due to the fact that um, increasingly, you know, with years of advancement of research, it's also, of course, it has also become very clear um, that um, it is important uh, to come up with laws, you know, to regulate, you know, our healthcare uh, system. And the reason for these laws, okay, which uh, then, of course, uh, becomes our legal responsibility, are uh, actually to regulate the healthcare system. And the, the main reason uh, is to protect the rights of both the practitioner and then the patient. So when you look at um, um, the Ghana Health, um, the Ghana uh, Health Service, for instance, patient charter, you look at it and even though it is actually stated as the Ghana Health Care Patients uh, Charter, you'd realize that some of these regulations we read carefully would, would, would you know, it, it, I mean, you would realize that not only are these uh, uh, um, um, uh, rules, right, actually meant to protect the patient, but to a certain extent, um, it also protects the practitioner. Okay? And uh, of course, this also applies to um, a lot more of these regulations um, that are available now. Um, the main reason um, for this health law uh, regulation um, is to protect both the practitioner and uh, uh, the patient, meaning that um, our, our legal responsibilities, you know, as um, professionals are actually mediated by law. Okay? And um, of course, anytime you hear about legal, legal, um, it only means that, you know, it is mediated by law, meaning that um, we need to take these um, uh, regulations very, very seriously because um, if, 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 if we do not take some of these legal, uh, um, these regulations very seriously, as we would actually see uh, when it comes to um, what we have in our code of ethics as, uh, as Gant, um, some of them can actually lead to uh, prosecutions. Um, these laws provide clear cut rules for practitioners to follow based on the laws of the society. So hence, when we, 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 we check uh, these responsibilities, it often leads to uh, breaking um, of these laws. And of course, these laws are partly determined by the government, uh, regulatory bodies, and then the society. And I must say that the determination of these laws by this group of people in the society are not mutually exclusive. So in, in, in some situations, we realize that uh, things that are happening in the society will then necessitate the, the regulatory bodies or authorities, uh, such as GAND, the, uh, I mean, uh, such as the Allied Health Professional Council, 
in our case, you know, to come out with some laws or certain things that are going on in the society could actually also necessitate um, the government uh, to come up with some regulations, right? Uh, to, 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 to govern the conduct, right? The ethical conduct of practice of, 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 of um, associations, right? Um, within its uh, the jurisdiction. And a very good example is the, the Ghanaian government in 2000, the year 2000, passing the uh, breastfeeding uh, promotion regulation code into a law. Of course, we know that this uh, was uh, largely influenced by the WHO's code, um, uh, code okay, to uh, promote or to improve uh, breastfeeding, okay? and also, of course, to uh, regulate or to control the sales of um, infant formula and other breast milk uh, substitutes. Okay? So, um, of course, these codes uh, definitely were actually based on research that have been done over the years. Um, uh, and, 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 of course, this research uh, necessitated, you know, the passing uh, or the coming up coming up of, of these schools, which uh, because of how serious it, I mean, they are, and they were actually uh, in 2000, for instance, the Ghanaian government actually enacted these schools into law, which is the LI 1667. Okay. And um, these laws or these codes, for instance, um, this example that I'm giving actually applies to all health workers. Um, including uh, uh, dietitians and nutritionists, of course, um, it 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 also applies to the healthcare system, and and then the manufacturers and and distributors as well. Of course, so acting in accordance with this code automatically then becomes the legal responsibility of the practitioner. And of course, based on these codes and other regulations, which um, I uh, would actually share later. Uh, necessitated, uh, uh, you know, informed GAN, okay, um, or necessitated the inclusion of some of these uh, 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 laws or code, you know, as part uh, of the GAN's uh, code of ethics. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, one of one of them uh, calling all practitioners to abide by all laws um, regarding the profession, whether uh, to set by the government or the institutions where the dietitian or the nutritionist actually practice. Okay, so um, we'll look at uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, example exactly what the code that is uh, in a, I mean associated with this particular um, uh, code. Okay, uh, some of I mean the code which is particularly associated with with this, um, and then as I said. Um, there are, of course, other legal responsibilities uh, which can actually be found in there. Uh, there are also other legal responsibilities, you know, that we as practitioners uh, need to follow. Okay? And these can actually be found in the Health Professional Regulatory Bodies Act, uh, 2013, which is Act 857, uh, and then the Public Health Act, uh, 2012, which is the Act. Um, 851. And as I said, um, um, we have documents on them that we would actually share so that later on um, you can actually familiarize yourself. So that is for the legal responsibility in terms of the basis for the legal responsibility. So what are also the basis for the responsibility? You know, whereas legal responsibilities usually are tied to legal system. Uh, social responsibilities are mainly based on ethics. They, they are mainly, mainly, mainly based on ethics. Um, uh, so when we talk about social responsibility, what is what is social responsibility all about? Because the 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 the, the simple explanation when we talk about social responsibility is the idea that people and institution must serve society as they as aspire to better themselves. And then the key point here is serve. So um, uh, whatever you are doing in terms of being a nutrition professional or a dietetic professional, even if you are being paid for it, okay, 
what you need to know is that you have a certain level of responsibility towards the patient or the client that you are seeing. Okay? And the bottom line is that it is always a service that you are you know, rendering to the, to the patient. Being it, you know, uh, what, as whether you're going to be paid or not, right? So it, is, it isn't something like um, a privilege, right? In a sense, but um, social responsibility is all about, you know, serving, you know, even as you aspire to better yourself. Okay? And a very good example, we can see this uh, in large companies. So where large companies are obliged by ethics to ensure that their activities, okay, whatever activities, and um, and this you can see this very clearly in terms of what what we call social responsibility. When it, when you go to the mining um, industry, especially the mining sites, where their activities, you know, whatever they are doing, even though they are mining to make money to better themselves, you know, as part of their social responsibilities, which is most, uh, which is mainly ethics, is to ensure that whatever they are doing, they protect the environment. Of course, we know what uh, uh, mining does to the environment, because it involves a lot of breaking, it involves a lot of digging, you know, cutting down trees, depending on you know, the site and everything. But as part of their social responsibility, they always have it in mind that at the end of whatever activity they are doing, uh, they still protect the environment. So that is why some, some of them, for instance, I mean, all of them, for instance, uh, involve themselves uh, in what we call uh, land reclamation. So we realize that after they mine in a certain place, they sort of plant and grow, uh, you know, trees, you know, uh, to reclaim. Um, and then again, not only to protect the environment, but also to promote the well-being of the community in which they operate. Okay. So um, this is a very good example that actually explains what social responsibility is. And this can actually be translated into our health setting, that whatever you are doing as a health professional, first of all, you should know that even as you aspire to better yourself, your activities do not harm the people, right, you are taking care of, okay? So this, and, and as I said, this, this in actually doing that or in actually uh, 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 in the process of, you know, serving and doing that, um, it could be a paid um, or unpaid. So, uh, for instance, um, I mean, coming back specifically to us as health workers, okay, um, a very good example of what we can term as our social responsibility is through advocacy. Um, I know for some time now, um, there have been a lot of advocacy drive. Um, and a, a very good example is the call to advocate for, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, low intake of uh, sugar sweetened beverages, for instance. I mean, for, for the past few weeks, you know, we've seen a lot of posters on our platform, you know, uh, encouraging, uh, uh, you know, dietitians and nutritionists to join floats and also to join, uh, uh, you know, forces in advocating advocating uh, for the low consumption of uh, sugar sweetened beverage. So through, through this, through advocacy, um, advocacy is one very good way um, we can um, actually sort of, uh, you know, uh, show that aspect of our social uh, responsibility. Um, another example is that we know the dynamics of malnutrition. We, we know as, as nutrition and dietetic profession, we know what, what, what some of the things that can actually constitute or can go into uh, a problem of malnutrition, um, especially for instance, under nutrition. Okay? Um, we know that uh, social and economic factors uh, uh, play a very important uh, role. And of course, uh, certain disparities, especially when you look at certain groups who, uh, besides the social and economics, uh, we know that certain groups like the vulnerable groups and all those things, uh, they all sort of uh, come together to perpetuate uh, malnutrition. So as part of our social responsibility, uh, for instance, what can we do to address some of these uh, issues? Of course, um, uh, one very good way 
uh, is through advocacy, right? As I mentioned, uh, where we can actually advocate for support for these vulnerable groups by collaborating with either uh, policymakers or interest group okay, to make this group uh, 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 better. And as I said from the beginning, this could purely be something that we uh, can be unpaid for, okay? Or we can do without actually expecting any uh, uh, thing back in the form of remuneration or not, right? As professionals, it's actually part of our social responsibility. Okay. So now let's straight away go into uh, what the GAN code of um, ethics uh, is concerning our legal and then social responsibility. So let's start um, with the legal responsibilities. So uh, the first one is, is that the nutrition and dietetic practitioner shall comply with all applicable laws and regulations concerning the profession, right? And will be subject to disciplinary action by GAND if the practitioner is convicted of a crime under the laws of the Republic uh, of Ghana, which is a felony or a misdemeanor, right? Which is an essential element uh, uh, um, of this, uh, which, with uh, an essential element, sorry, uh, of which dishonesty uh, and which is related to practice and, 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 and the practice of the profession. So what is, what is this saying? Uh, this is saying that um, as a professional, once you are actually convicted under the laws of Ghana, so for instance, if you, through your practice, you know, as a professional, if whatever you are doing actually constitutes you know, a felony or a misdemeanor, or in any way, you know, uh, constitute an element of dishonesty, right? Gun as a professional body uh, would also uh, 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 bring disciplinary action against you as a professional. So not only will you be sanctioned, you know, at the level um, of our, our law courts, but then, um, as a professional uh, a practitioner, you would also be sanctioned. So this is why I mentioned from the beginning that we are ambassadors. And we are representative wherever we, we find ourselves once we are members of GAN and we proudly call ourselves members of GAN. Whatever we do, um, once it is going to have you know, an effect on the image um, of the profession, um, um, a disciplinary action would be, be brought against you. Um, also, a disciplinary action would also be uh, brought against you if, for instance, you are disciplined by the Ministry of Health or the Ghana Health Service, or your actions go contrary to our regulatory body, the Allied Health Professional Council, okay? Or not even that, but then if your conduct um, uh, it's also uh, or goes against where you work, your workplace. Um, that would also amount to some disciplinary action by Gant. Okay. So um, we should uh, take note that um, whatever we do outside the our conduct outside the you know the the boundaries of you know our professional practice you know as. Uh, 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 regulated or, or as you know, uh, spelled out by Gand. Um, if whatever we are doing even goes beyond, I mean, if our actions are such that um, we are disciplined by, you know, uh, you know, our regulatory bodies like other head profession council, of course, where we work, our workplace, and then it comes to the attention of Gand, um, a disciplinary action would also be brought. Um, against you. Um, also, um, the professional will be subject to disciplinary action if the practitioner commit an act of um, misfeasance, that is fraud, or malfeasance, that is any medical malpractices, which is directly related to the practice of the profession as determined by a court of competence jurisdiction, 
or an agency of a government body like the Ghana Health Service or the Ministry of Health. Um, once your actions, um, you commit these actions, uh, disciplinary actions, uh, actions would also be brought against you uh, by Gant um, as a practitioner. Um, then again, as uh, a practitioner, uh, your services shall be redrawn, right, from professional practice if you engage in substance abuse, such as ban narcotics um, in the Republic of Ghana, uh, that would affect your practice. Of course, um, none, of, none of us here would want to be taken care of um, by somebody who, or your relatives, you, know, you wouldn't want your relative to be taken care of uh, by somebody who is on cloud nine or very high. Okay. Um, of course, once you wouldn't want that, uh, uh, the, our code of ethics also prohibits that. Uh, and for that reason, once you engage in substance abuse and, uh, and it comes to the attention um, of, of, of Gant, uh, per our code of ethics, um, your services shall be, be, be withdrawn. And I think last week, uh, our presenter, uh, Mario D. Collins, actually made mention of uh, the fact that some time back, um, you know, we had, and, 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 I, I, and I personally know that story that, you know, we have dietitian, we had, we, had, we had a dietitian who, you know, comes to work drunk. And in fact, I also heard that sometimes uh, they have to go and call this dietitian, you know, uh, you know uh, from, from the blue kiosk. Or uh, sometimes they have to go and call him, you know, he's drinking, you know, his uh, alcoholic beverages. Okay. Um, as di dietitians, um, it is our re legal responsibility uh, not to engage, uh, or as nutritionists, it's, it's our legal responsibility not to engage in substance abuse. Then again, the, the nutrition and the dietetic practitioner shall withdraw from professional practice. Um, if the practitioner is adjured by a court or by a diagnosis, uh, by a competent psychiatrist, especially when the professional in question has willingly subjected themselves, you know, uh, to be assessed, okay, uh, to be mentally incompetent. You know, once uh, that is determined, uh, that particular professional um, would be asked to withdraw from uh, professional practice. So that um, is um, uh, when it comes to our legal responsibility. So what about our social responsibility? And remember, um, I mentioned that our social responsibility uh, is largely you know, undergird or underpinned by ethics. Okay. So what, are the, what is the gun social responsibility? And we'll talk about our social responsibility. Uh, the nutrition and dietetic professionals shall collaborate with others to reduce health disparities. You know, when we talk about health disparities, we are talking about opportunities to achieve optimal health care, okay? especially by the socially disadvantaged population. Okay? So um, it is your social responsibility um, that um, you collaborate with other health professionals to reduce health dis uh, dis disparities and also to protect human rights. And of course, human rights have become a very big issue uh, globally now. And, and in fact, this social responsibility, uh, once as a professional, um, you don't adhere to it, um, it can to some extent lead, lead to uh, some legal implications. So as a um, health professional, um, it is our social responsibility to make sure that uh, this happens. Then the nutrition and dietetic practitioner shall also promote fairness and objectivity okay, with fair and equitable treatment. And for me, um, of course, all, all that I have said is important, right? But when you look at uh, this, especially promoting fairness and objectivity okay, with fair and equitable impartial treatment. So we talk about the situations where, you know, you are, you know, seeing a client or a patient, you know, depending on their social, I mean, you should not be sort of um, influenced by uh, 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 their, their socioeconomic status or, or, or whatever. So for instance, if you are giving 
uh, treatment to someone with a higher purchasing power and someone um, whose social economic status is, is low. Your treatment should be fair. What do I mean by fair? Whatever, you, you know, we, we shouldn't sort of prescribe, you know, something that is authentic and then, of course, something that is less authentic to the other one with, you know, low social economic status. Of course, um, the, uh, what we can do is to provide or, or recommend an alternative, okay, which, which will do the same work um, um, as, as the one that is expensive. But of course, this alternative um, uh, would be uh, much more affordable, for instance, for the person with uh, socioeconomic status. So here, equity and fairness uh, when it comes to treatment uh, is very important. Um, when it comes to our social responsibility, then the nutrition and dietetic practitioner shall contribute time and expertise to activities that promote respect, integrity, and competence of the profession. And this also is very, very important. And when we talk about contributing time, you know, over the years, uh, we have situations where, you know, when people are called upon, uh, you know, to help. And as I said, social responsibility could be paying or not paying. Okay? Um, we shouldn't always make time for things that um, uh, uh, only pays. Okay? Uh, it is important that when we get the opportunity to improve and to promote this profession in any way, um, whether we are going to be paid for it or not, you know, we should sacrifice you know, time. Um, this morning, I think uh, one of our dietitians you know, uh, was on TV to talk about you know, diabetes and diet, for instance. Okay. And um, I, am, I'm, I'm, I mean, for sometimes when people were, of course, this, this, this is actually part of what his social responsibility to the public is, you know, going in there to educate the public you know, about diet and diabetes. You know. He may uh, 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 be paid you know, for, for his transport or not, but you know, trying to make time to contribute to, the, uh, to promote the integrity of the, of the profession, you know, contributing time and expertise. You know, it's uh, in terms of his social responsibility. It's it's a very good thing. So um, uh, the Gantt Code of Ethics actually encourages that we we contribute time, especially when it comes to serving on committees. You know, for so many years, I realize that when it comes to associations uh, like Gantt, you know, when people are asked to volunteer to serve on committees and all those, all those they may have expertise. You know, but uh, to contribute to their time, you know, becomes uh, a problem. Okay. So as part of our social responsibilities, I would encourage that um, when we are called upon, you know, to contribute time and then expertise to activities to promote respect, integrity, and competence of our profession, we should do that. If we don't do that, um, the other alternative would be that you would actually see, uh, I would say, quacks. Okay, um, going, you know, uh, uh, on air and you know, uh, you know, writing in the print media about things that uh, may, at the long, a medium to long term, uh, be detrimental to whatever we are working to promote, especially when it comes to uh, nutrition and, and, and dietetics in, in Ghana. Um, the another. Uh, social responsibility as captured by our code of ethics is that the nutrition and dietetic practitioner shall promote the unique role of nutrition and dietetic practitioners. And of course, this is the example that um, um, uh, I just gave that it's important that we actually uh, um, sort of, you know, uh, volunteer time. Okay? Uh, example is to engage in services that benefit the community and to enhance the public's trust in the profession, as we volunteer, you know, our time and our expertise, we go on air, right? And of course, this is something that over the years, um, I can say we are really making very good progress. You know, uh, some years back, you, know, you see very few same people, you know, uh, helping to promote the unique role of the dietetic and the nutrition professional by 
by by volunteering or accepting you know to to engage you know the community and the public okay. um, recently i mentioned uh, recently that uh, there was a call for people to join uh, you know for instance uh, a float to sensitize um, the niche, i mean uh, the community you know and as we do that what then happens is that we sort of build public you know trust in the profession of course, they come to a point where, especially if the information we are giving is authentic and it, 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 and it is working, okay, what then, I mean, what that will do to us as professionals is that once you appear anywhere and you introduce yourself as a nutrition or a, 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 or a dietetic professional, okay, when you speak, the public would actually hear you. Okay. So um, then, uh, I mean, so how are we able to get to that point? We're able to get that to that point when we, as uh, uh, nutrition and dietetic practitioners, you know, promote the unique role of the nutrition and dietetic uh, profession okay, by engaging uh, in these um, activities. Last but not the least, uh, the nutrition and dietetic practitioner shall seek leadership opportunities in professional community and serve organizations to enhance health and nutritional status while protecting the public, right? So it is also very important for us to also seek opportunities. I always say that when it comes to, um, you know, volunteering, you know, uh, for lead leadership positions, it's also one of our very biggest challenge. Okay? I mean, our current, you know, governing, you know, uh, uh, board members, for instance, you know, are doing very uh, uh, wonderful job, and it would interest you to know because I have been in that position some years back. That you know, a lot of the things they are doing, they are doing it as part of their social responsibility, right? You know, um, anytime there's a call to 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 take up a position, you know, to lead the organization, to help in organizing stuff, you realize that very few people, you know, avail themselves to serve. But you know, as you know, health professionals, um, it is actually our social responsibility okay, to seek some of these positions. Sometimes we don't have to wait. So, for instance, GAN currently, you know, they are quite. You know, the work is big. Uh, the work is a lot. There are a lot of committees, subcommittees. Uh, uh, people are being, you know, asked for, you know, to come up and take up leadership opportunities to assist to drive. Uh, the, uh, um, um, the organization. Of course, as we drive the organization, it's not just the organization that benefits, but at the end of the day, the community also uh, benefits. And at the end of the day, whatever our activities are, is what is geared towards enhancing the health and nutritional status whilst protecting the public. So these um, are um, our code of ethics in terms of our legal and social responsibility. So before I end my present, present, presentation, I would like to uh, say a very big thank you to uh, Esime, uh, Teresa, and then Patrick Ewa uh, you know, for assisting me with some um, with information you know, um, as I prepared for the presentation. So thank you very much. Um, at this point, I would uh, hand over to the MC and then um, we can actually start the discussion. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. So Prince. Hello. Thank yes. you very much, Dr. Hayford. Um, Ms. Sanam Klomega, please, are you online? Hello, Prince, yes, I am. Yes, please kindly take over. <laughs> OK. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayford, for the presentation. Thank you for taking us through our legal and social responsibilities as members of the Ghana Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So um, I think the floor is open now, and let's let's hear from us. What questions do we have? What examples? What comments do we have? Let's hear them. If you, you can. Um, Raise your hand and I'll call you, unmute yourself, then you'd 
ask your question or you'd give your comment or if you are unable to speak you can write whatever comments you have in the chat session and i will read it out all right so let's hear from you what what do we have to say what do we have to add on to what dr hayford has said what do we have to ask from you. Yes, Maxwell, please go ahead. Thank you so much. And thank you for the very insightful presentation. Um, the question I wanted to ask is, that, um, is it wrong if a dietitian has a food supplement? shop okay have pharma pharmacists are having pharmacies so where they they have drugs so in the same manner if we are trained as nutrition professionals and it's our food then we will be much better to inform the public about the use of such products so if a practicing dietitian decide to open up a food supplement shop patients ask saying where can I get this product and you know very well that you have that in your shop how do you go about it to prevent a potential conflict of interest issue? That's the first question. My second question is, we, where, where does, where's the thing uh, regards to the law as to our limit of practice when it comes to food supplements? Because uh, the multivitamin B complex, the iron supplements are all considered food supplements. Most times doctors who normally we require for those uh, supplements or we normally prescribe. So if a dietitian decides to recommend a multivite, is he doing anything against law? And what does the Ministry of Health say about that? I mean, I, want, I wanted to know because I know that we are allowed to, I mean, sell or prescribe certain supplements. Though we are being careful to be sure that whatever we do is in the interest of the patient. So despite the other ones we recommend, what happens to those ones which are more like medicinal, considered medicinal? Is it out of our jurisdiction? So that's my question, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Maxwell. And um, to the, the second question, uh, probably I would defer to our colleagues uh, who are more into clinical practice uh, probably to, to advise in terms of, I mean, to, to let us know in terms of what the, the scope of, uh, in terms of their practice as to whether um, as, uh, as a dietitian, um, you are actually allowed to, to prescribe a supplement or a multivitamin supplement. I know in some jurisdictions, for instance, um, in the developed countries, um, they are actually allowed. So um, I remember when we had the, the training on the, uh, the total parental nutrition and then the TPNs and, 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 the, and, the, and the last, I think at the beginning of this year, um, we had uh, presenters actually talking about the prescribing some of these um, uh, 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 feeds, okay, uh, feeds in the hospital, you know, they are allowed. So um, I think what we should ask ourselves in, within our jurisdiction, um, what does the, the law say or what are the guidelines you know, in, our, in our hospitals? So um, I think that our colleagues who are into clinical practice who are on the ground probably could give us a very good advice. I mean, could give us a very good picture what uh, you know, the rules or the guidelines uh, say. Uh, in terms of the first question you ask, if you are a practitioner, for instance, I mean, you know that this is what is good for you. I mean, this is what is good for the patient. You have them in your facility. Whether it is ethical to, to prescribe what you have. Okay. So usually what I always say is that um, you should always you know, ask yourself as to what, whether as to what you are doing uh, there is a possibility of any conflict of interest. You know, how would the patient feel? Would the patient feel that 
if they don't buy your supplement and they decide that they want to go and buy it somewhere, um, whether it would have any influence on their subsequent visit or their care. Okay, uh, and these are, you know, uh, some of the things um, as we practice, we need to have it at the back of our mind because we have to position ourselves in um, in a way that. Uh, at the end of that, as I said, it is all about the patient. We have to position ourselves in such a way that we would not sort of give the implications, okay, that if, for instance, the patient decides to uh, not buy from you, but then buy from somebody else, it is you know, not going to influence, or he or she would not feel that it is going to influence uh, in terms of the, uh, his or her care especially uh, you know, uh, in, in future meetings. So uh, for me, uh, uh, I, I usually would advise that you know, when, when we are considering some of those things, we should have those things in mind you know, to, to make sure that we don't sort of create any conflict of interest. Secondly, uh, what does the, you know, our guidelines and our regulations also say? Do we have clear-cut regulations that says that um, as a professional, um, you cannot have, you know, a business okay? uh, that sort of uh, is within your area of specialty. Of course, we know when you go to the other healthcare, our other colleagues in the healthcare uh, 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 professional or other practitioners, of course, they do have, you know, their own private hospitals because that is what they are trained, you know, to do. So um, what are their regulations saying? Is it wrong for them to have hospitals, right? Or is it right for them to, to send their patients from the public hospitals where they practice to their private hospitals for further care? So all these things are uh, uh, questions that we need to actually ask ourselves, right? Yes, so that's, those are my responses to your questions. Maybe they take from any other uh, yeah. uh, just a, a quick one. Eh? So a, a follow-up. Um, so if you give the patient options and the patient still choose to buy from your shop, is this still a conflict of interest? Yeah, so what do we think? Yes, to, to the other colleagues, is this still a conflict of interest? Colleagues, what do we think? Will it still be a conflict of interest or you've done your part? So it's the patient who has decided to go with your shop. Would it be a conflict of interest or it would not be? Hello, are we on? I'm asking these questions because um, I think that our position on food supplements, though we know the abuse and we know how some of the other companies um, have always attached false claims, and I totally agree that in dealing with it, we need to be do the due diligence and ensure that we are not uh, abusing the recommendation because of our profession. However, I feel that sometimes as dietitians, we have made this food supplementing too much of a big issue to the extent that it even scares, I mean, professional dietitians who may want to probably have those options in case their patients may need, not necessarily putting it in the office or your consulting room per se, but even putting it somewhere, sometimes you are still being seen some way as in you are going to exploit a patient and all that. So it would be very good to get a very clear cut rules as to these things and, and how we can go about it. And that's why I'm bringing these issues up. Well, I think that it's quite useful in terms of- 
Yeah. Uh, Maswell, uh, and probably these are uh, some of the things that uh, going forward we can look at because uh, these, I mean, looking at everything that we have, you know, um, gone through for the past three weeks in terms of the code of ethics, um, I see them to be, some of them are very specific, but then some of them are also broad. So for me, I think going forward, um, we can look at them each, uh, I mean, one, uh, uh, one by one, and then probably, you know, be more specific, come up with, you know, more, uh, 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 guidelines, you know, specific guidelines, you know, to as to um, the interpretation, if I may ask, uh, if I may add, to 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 the interpretations to you know those codes of of conduct, of course, um, including um, what our views are. Of course, food supplements, as we know, uh, as professionals, um, are not. Uh, something bad, you know, especially when it comes to our multivitamins and mineral supplements. I mean, there are indications or there are times that um, uh, after assessment, uh, we may uh, have to prescribe or not, depending on, you know, the, the patient, you know, that we are uh, uh, taking care of. Of course, that is also the reason why one of our codes of ethics talked, talked about um, whatever decision we, we, we take, concerning our patients uh, should be evidence-based. So if there is evidence to support uh, that, you know, um, the patient's intake may not be enough and looking at the patient condition, uh, the best would be to supplement. Um, uh, that by itself uh, is not uh, wrong. Um, uh, but then of course, um, the ethical uh, things that are attached to it as to where, uh, where it is coming from. Is it being sold by the, the practitioner themselves, okay? Um, or is a practitioner coercing the patient to get it, you know, by force from themselves? So those are some of the things uh, we, we, we as, uh, you know, an organization probably would have to come out clearly okay, to indicate, you know, as part of, um, you know, the regulations, you know, for our profession. Thank you very much. Please, do we have any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying that my, my concerns have been addressed. The, the first question no. about the motivate issue. I remember Ghana has ever had some documents. I tried reaching out for that document. I couldn't find it. I'm not really sure what it said, but there was something on prescribing supplement in consultation with a medical doctor or something. So I don't know if chief, chief is on the line, if chief can help us, if there's any document that clearly states what is the limit of our boundary with regards to food supplement, it will be very helpful because in our training, we are not taught how to write those prescriptions. For instance, I learned it from other colleague doctors, but Sometimes you are even afraid to do that because you are, you are not really sure where your the limit of scope of your practice is, you know. And so once you are not comfortable, you may not want to do that, even though in other jurisdiction is open up to dietitians. So it's also good as professionals, we get clear cutoff points with regards to those uh, motivate the B complex, those ones considered as integral part of the medications, not just the normal. Um, supplement in the market where you can just go and buy without a supplement. So I think it's a major issue that I, I would wish the management or leadership of Ghana look into it so that we know our clear point because ignorance of the law is not an excuse, you know, and it, it's not good for a problem to happen before you are now going to form a committee to interpret what, what, whether this person is at fault. But if there are clear guidelines, it solves the issue at once. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maxwell, for your questions and your comments. GB has noted it and would look into it as you have suggested. <clears throat> any other questions, any other comments? Anything from any other person? So we've just discussed the GAN Code of Ethics, looking at our principle of justice. 
looking at our legal and social responsibilities. What do we have to say? Hello, gang members, are we on? Okay, um, since we have no questions or comments, I think that um, I would like to say a big thank you to Dr. Hayford for taking us through this section of our code of ethics. We've been made to know that as members of GAND or as nutrition and dietetic practitioners, we have legal and social responsibilities for both to our patients and also to ourselves. So I know that we are going to go out there and ensure that whatever we do, we will do it considering or taking into consideration that we are gun members and we have a code of ethics guiding how we practice or what we do so that we will not, for want of a better word, get into any trouble that would require us to have to be defended. We'll make sure that whatever we do, we do it upholding our principle of autonomy, our principle of maleficence, non-maleficence and beneficence, and also the principle of justice. So thank you once again, Dr. Hayford. The presentation was very insightful. And thank you for also letting us know that it is good to help or contribute our services or expertise to promote the competence of the profession, given the examples that you stated. And to also let us know that it is important to take part in leadership opportunities or um, volunteer to help. So this means that very soon, GB will be reaching out to a lot of us to volunteer our services or help serve on some committees because quite a number of us are on committees and we would need more people to help move the academy forward. So thank you very much for joining us. If you haven't received any of the certificates for all the other presentations we've had, kindly reach out to the secretariat and you'll be sorted out. And when you make payments for your certificates, please do well to send screenshots to the Gantt Treasury number. Yeah. So please ensure also that you have filled the Google form that was shared in the chat for your attendance for today's CPD. We'll come your way next week with another CPD and that one is going to cater for category C of the CPDs that we are supposed to have or we are supposed to, to take. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayford. Have a lovely day and bye-bye.